There we go. Okay. So again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Connie Kohlmeyer. I'm an educator with the Conservation Foundation. And today I also have a couple of my coworkers here with me, Jessica and Kyla. They're joining us today and we're going to be talking all about gardening. So for those of you who are just getting to know us, the Conservation Foundation is a nonprofit organization. We are proud to be accredited by the Land Trust Accreditation Commission. And our mission is to improve the health of our communities by preserving and restoring natural areas and open spaces, protecting rivers and watersheds and promoting stewardship of our environment. This work is very important in preserving our quality of life. Open space improves our air quality, preserves habitat for all kinds of wildlife and creates opportunities for people to enjoy the outdoors. Planting native plants in our gardens is a form of environmental stewardship and growing our own food contributes to the health of our communities. So that's what we'll be learning about today. And we'd like to thank Bedrock, Bedrock Earthscapes and Itasca Bank and Trust for sponsoring this webinar. Sponsors help to keep us uh, keep these webinars free for everyone. So please contact us for more information if you're interested in sponsoring. I'll post our contact information and the links for our sponsors' websites in the chat and on YouTube with the recording when we post that. So you can also help us to keep these webinars free. If you enjoy the webinars, please, we encourage you to donate and help TCF, the Conservation Foundation, continue to do all the wonderful things we do, including and in addition to our webinars. When you become a member also, you'll get to enjoy a wide variety of members only offerings. You can sign up for our emails and also follow us on social media as well to learn more and stay up to date on our events and happenings, whether you're a member or not. So we do have, speaking of events and happenings, we've got some really exciting things coming up down the line here in our, on our calendars. Thursday, April 27th is our annual Earth Day benefit dinner. This is a critical source of funding for our important work and to save nearby nature and waterways, we need the funding to continue this work. So um, in order to connect adults and children of all ages to the wonders of the natural world and protect it as we work so hard to do. So we are excited to gather at Bobak's signature events again this year. And we hope that you'll join us for delicious food, a really popular silent auction and uh, just a generally wonderful evening. It'll be a lot of fun. So we'll post a link for that event in the chat. And then since we're talking about gardening today, I of course have to mention that we have our annual plant sale coming up. So we'll have a great selection of popular native plants for your garden and certified organic vegetable and herb plants. Plus we'll have some seed packets, compost and composters, rain barrels, honey from, our, from the hives that are right there at our very own McDonald Farm in South Naperville. And the plant sale will be in person this year. So we'll be offering farm tours as well. Um, since we'll be in person, we get to do that. We, we kind of missed that when we had to be completely online. But um, in addition to the in-person sale on May 12th and 13th, we are also going to be offering some very special plant kits that can only be pre-ordered online. They must be picked up during the in-person sale, um, but these kits are really cool. They feature hand-selected groupings of plants that will make your garden planning much easier this year. And they also come with a sample design layout. So these are really nice. Um, there will be limited numbers of those kits available. So you'll want to watch for the online ordering and that opens on May 4th for members of the Conservation Foundation and our Green Earth Harvest Farm shareholders. And then May 5th through the 7th, the uh, online ordering is open for everyone. So because it's such a busy time of year and we have so many fun things happening at the farm, I can't possibly mention them all here. So I do want to also make sure you check out the website and the rest of our events. We have Nature on the Farm Camp registration open. We've got a really cool Facebook Live event coming up from 1 to 2 p.m. on May 1st. So we can answer all of your gardening questions just in case we don't get to them all today. We'll get to as many as we can. And um, just make sure that you check out the website for all of the other events. Spring is a busy time. We have all kinds of fun things going on. So for today's webinar, we're going to be talking about planting a garden. So we're talking about planting a garden with native plants with Jessica Mino, our Kane and Kendall County Program Director. And I'll chat a little bit about planting our vegetable and herb gardens. And then our community engagement coordinator, Kyla Muhammad, will share information with us about how and why to plant both native plants and our vegetables and herbs, and also where to source our seeds and our plants for our garden. 
So I will be posting links in the chat. And um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jessica so we can get started and um, share a lot of really cool information about native plants. Great, thank you so much, Connie. Um, I'll start, start sharing my screen here. So I uh, just wanna make sure you can see that okay. Um, well, welcome everybody. Uh, yes, as Connie said, I'm Jessica Mino, the Kane and Kendall County Program Director for the Conservation Foundation. I'm gonna start us off here today talking about native plants. Um, so what we consider to be native plants, what we mean by that term, uh, why we're so excited to incorporate these types of plants into our gardens, uh, what the benefits uh, we see of them being in, in our gardens are, and then how we might choose between some of these native plants because we have uh, a plethora, just hundreds of species to choose from. So how we might wanna go about selecting that right plant for the right place. So to start us off, what is a native plant? Um, so we're considering a native plant as something that was uh, naturally found in this region, something that evolved here over thousands of years alongside our native wildlife. Um, so they really co-benefit off of each other um, and depend on one another. And uh, so that's what we're referring to as we go through and talk about native plants today. And why do we want to choose native plants? Well, one of those big components is that native plants are kind of the base for our entire ecosystem. We have a lot of insects and a lot of little creatures that depend just on our native plants. Um, they do not utilize ornamental plants in the same way that they can utilize native plants. And then those creatures are really the base of the food chain for a, a ton of other species um, that are around our area, native to our area. So really getting those native plants is that base habitat, uh, food source, um, shelter, protection that a lot of our species need in this area. But beyond that, there's some other great reasons that we love native plants. Uh, one of the main reasons is their beautifully deep root systems. So this graphic I have here uh, is showing the root system of some native plants on the right-hand side and some of our more ornamental species on the left-hand side. Um, hydrangeas, daylilies, things that we see a lot in our landscaping right now, but weren't originally in this area um, for the last couple thousand years until we decided to um, start planting them here. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side, those native plants have really deep root systems in comparison to some of these other traditional landscaping plants. And just uh, for scale or for reference, um, those numbers in the middle are in meters, not feet. So we're talking some of the native plants can go down seven, eight plus um, feet down into the earth. And we really love that for a couple reasons. Um, one is that each of those little root systems acts like a highway for water to get back down into the earth. So when it rains, rather than just having a few inches, like you might see in that Kentucky bluegrass, our normal turf grass, um, a few inches to follow the root systems down into the earth. These native plants give highways for that water to get back down into our earth, which allows um, that infiltration, allows a lot more water to be put back into our groundwater systems, um, recharging our groundwater systems. Um, it also prevents that water from running right off the earth and into our rivers and streams, preventing downstream flooding, but also carrying pollutants with it. So the water going back on, down into the earth acts more like a natural filtration system and replenishes um, our hydrological cycles. So we really love those deep root systems for those reasons as well. And ultimately we're looking to make our landscapes functional. And we see native plants as a great way to do that. Um, this image is taken, if you can tell, the grass kind of has more of a yellow brown look on the left hand side. So we're guessing this is probably more like August, right? This time of year. This is a typical scene for us in August uh, in Illinois in the Midwest. 
But on the right hand side, we have uh, it's it's full of native plants. Um, we've got butterfly milkweed, the orange flower there. We have some native grasses. We have cone flower, and it is thriving even in that hot, hot, dry time of year. Um, it's green, it's blooming, it's beautiful. So in these native plants, right, they're used to the conditions here. They're used to these seasonal changes. Um, those deep roots help with that as well. But they don't need much watering after they are established. Um, they can handle the dry spells. They can even handle spring flooding in some areas. And, and we'll kind of go through which plants like the wetter areas and the drier areas more. Um, but really we're talking about making a landscape that's beautiful for us to enjoy and low maintenance. And so with that being said, um, I think a great place to start incorporating native plants into our yards and our gardens are in our problem areas. Um, those native plants, like I said, are, are kind of used to the seasons and some of the conditions and the soil types in this area. So if we have really dry areas, if we have really shaded areas, there are native plants that like those conditions. If we have wet areas where there's kind of standing water sometimes, maybe all year round, maybe there's a lot of standing water in the spring and then it dries out. We also have native plants that are used to those conditions um, because they're used to those fluctuations in the seasons and different areas, um, the rivers and streams we have around here. There, was, there were plants thriving around those areas um, for a very long time. So it's just about choosing the right plant for the right place. And that's what we're gonna kind of get through in this next little bit about how you might select some of the native plants that'll work in a certain area with very low maintenance because they like those conditions. Um, and it's just about selecting the right plant so that instead of having a problem area, all of a sudden you can have a green full thriving area in your garden or yard that also causes you to um, need less maintenance around that. So our first consideration of course is always sun or shade, right? Um, in full sun, as you can imagine, as we're thinking about prairie plants that used to be uh, covering a lot of Illinois, since we're the prairie state, um, there were a lot of plants that really thrived in that full, full sun. I've just got a few here um, on the screen for you. I'm going to particularly point out that prairie blazing star, that bright purple spike on the left-hand side, or purple prairie clover on the right hand side. As you can see, that looks different than um, some of the other clovers that are brought in for other reasons. Our prairie clover has a very neat, bright um, top to it, and there's a lot of color to choose from as well. But there is also a lot of color and a lot of variety that we can choose for shady areas. We had a lot of oak woodlands throughout this area as well. So it's not just sun loving prairie plants that we have. We have a lot of shade plants that can do very well in low shade situations. Uh, in your own yard or garden, it might be under that big tree where turf grass is not doing well. And that's because turf grass really wasn't meant for the shade, but these plants were. These plants love the shade. Um, so we've got Pennsylvania sedge in that upper right-hand corner. Uh, sedges are a great, um, family of plants that look kind of like grasses, but they're not grasses, um, they're sedges, and they can handle shade, they can handle, there are certain types that can handle wet areas, there's certain types that do like the sun instead of the shade, um, so it's just about selecting the right species, but in the shade, we can really fill that space up with some of these, um, plants that don't like full sun and really thrive in those shady um, conditions, but still have beautiful blooms like the wild geranium, woodland phlox, and wild columbine um, with that red flower that hummingbirds really love. Next, um, in thinking about sun versus shade, we also want to think about wet versus dry. Um, so again, there are plants that love the wet area. Um, I've got some photos up here just to show you the variety of plants 
that can love those wet areas. Um, we can get a lot of color still in areas that have standing water, moist soils, or um, just occasional flooding. And the same with dry areas. If there's areas that have more clay content or are higher uphill, um, or I should say have more of a gravel content too, right? That drain very quickly. Um, there are some beautiful blooming plants that are used to those conditions and actually bloom in the height of the heat and dry summer, um, like the black eyed Susan and um, bring that color, bring that food source for our pollinators and wildlife, but um, really thrive in those dry conditions and don't need us to be watering them when there's dry spouts in the summer, which is really wonderful. Um, I do always recommend though, um, in any of these conditions, that you add in some prairie grasses like the prairie drop seed or little blue stem or the sedges in, in um, among those flowers. So that way you can really have some structure, right? And it looks full green and alive throughout the year. And there's a couple um, types of ways that we can landscape with these native plants. Um, one is called native but neat, right? Uh, when we bring up the word and in, in the phrase native plants, a lot of people think, oh, I, I don't want a full on prairie here though, right? I can't have that um, fuller look, uh, or I just don't prefer that fuller look, and that's okay. We can come up with this kind of like native but neat structure where we clump native plants. We choose native plants that are lower growing, so that way um, it does still have that tailored look, but we have those benefits of the native plants still built into our gardens. But Wild and free is always welcome as well. And in my opinion, just as beautiful. So it's just your preference and, and what works for you. The important thing here is just um, bringing in some of those benefits of the deep roots and the native plants that our wildlife depends on into our gardens. We might also though want to um, consider a few other factors when selecting our native plants. Um, one is bloom time. So it's great to have plants that bloom throughout the year. This is really going to benefit our pollinators and our wildlife. Um, so when it first warms up in the spring through the end of fall and things are going dormant, hibernating, or migrating, um, it's great to have food source and habitat for all of those species throughout the entire year. And we can do that simply by carefully selecting the plants that we're putting in our garden. Um, here I've got the same garden at different times of year. Uh, this is actually a garden at the King County Government Center in Geneva, Illinois. And the top photo is the garden in about June. You can see the beautiful orange blooming there. Um, that's butterfly milkweed that's really thriving in June um, and honestly continues to thrive for many months throughout the year. Um, but then the bottom photo is more in September. As you can see, the purple, that's a plant called Monarda or bee balm. We've got some yellow cone flower. Um, we have some black eyed Susans blooming there. And there continues to be that food source um, for wildlife, even as the butterfly milkweed has started to fade out. These are just two phases of, of the seasons. Um, there are also some very early blooming spring native plants. Then you can think about early summer, like the butterfly milkweed in the top photo. You can think about the late summer, like the bottom photo. And then we have plants um, in the aster and goldenrod family that do really well later in the year um, through fall even. So that way we have that bloom time all throughout the year. We also want want to think about um, some of the growing nature factors of the plants, one being height, right? So that's really important. Um, some native plants can get really tall, like the native sunflower species, one of them, the sawtooth sunflower on the far right hand side, that can get eight feet. If you're looking for some type of screen, that can be done with native plants. But they are not all that high. They do not all grow that high. And we can choose the right height for the situation we're looking for. Starting from 
prairie smoke, which is on the far left, which only gets a few inches above ground. Um, I absolutely adore that plant because as you can see, the bloom kind of looks like a little puff of pink smoke, feathery smoke on top. It is so cool, um, but only stays about eight to 12 inches above the ground um, as a flowering plant. The next one I've got on there is porcupine sedge. It's one of the shorter sedges, um, only gets up to about a foot. There are sedges that can get up to a couple feet. And then grasses, of course, that can range from low lying to a little bit taller as well. And then in the middle there, I have butterfly milkweed, a milkweed species that only gets about two to three feet when there are, again, other milkweed species that can get more around four feet. Um, and four feet's around um, where I have that prairie blazing star, that blue spike, or I'm sorry, that purple spike um, and the fourth photo, that gets about four feet. So you can choose, do I want it low lying? Do I want it a medium height, little fuller meadow look? Do I want something a little bit taller, but not crazy tall like the sunflowers and, and aim for that four feet towards the back of my garden? Um, to have a little bit of height and beauty towards the back, towards a fence or something. Um, so choosing the height can be an important aspect when you're choosing your native plants. And then another um, growing nature attribute that we want to talk about is whether it's spreading or clumping naturally. Um, there are ones that do serve as more of a ground cover or fill out a garden a little more. But we also have native plants that stay more um, as individual plants or in a clumping fashion. Uh, again, depending on what we're looking for um, in our landscaping plan, in our garden design, and um, where we're looking to plant it. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the beautiful native trees and shrubs that we also have to choose from. Um, so, we have a plethora of native shrubs actually um, that again really provide a lot of shelter and food as well for our wildlife that are great to consider for screening um, between neighbors instead of some of our more ornamental plants that don't necessarily provide that food source or habitat in the same way. This um, shrub photo on the left or the whole display there, that great page layout, was uh, created in coordination with one of our partners, the Wild Ones of Greater Kane County, um, who also worked with us to create a number of uh, guides around different types of native plants, a whole series called Meet Our Native Plants, and those are available on our website. Um, it shows you some different photos of each native plant close up, far away, so you can kind of see again that the growing nature of those plants. Um, but then it also shows some things that go well with those native plants, some things that um, like to live in the same environment under the same conditions um, and support each other. Um, but in addition to those Meet Our Native Plant Guides, we also have a Bringing Nature to Your Yard landscaping guide that takes into account some all of these factors um, on our website that we went through today because it can be a lot. Um, it's It seems like a lot at the start, you know, where do I start and I want something that's for a dry, sunny condition that's three feet tall. Well, hopefully this guide can help you find some plants. Um, to, to start incorporating into your gardens. And with that, I'd just like to leave on the note that I uh, hope you also find time to enjoy this space because as we do incorporate more native plants, I think you will see an abundance of life coming um, to your gardens. So it's always great to consider um, building in some sort of a bench path or stepping stone so that way you can enjoy this um, great diversity that you've brought to, to your space. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Connie. Hey, Rico, thank you so much, Jessica. I'm gonna jump right in and share my screen here. And um, what I will be chatting a little bit about and sharing today is, um, let me get this menu out of the way. This always gets right in my way, so I can't share, there we go. Okay, um, 
what I'm going to be sharing a little bit about today ties a lot into what Jessica was sharing with us and also what Kyla is going to be sharing. So I'm just kind of um, touching on a lot of kind of similar topics that they're go both going to be talking about, um, but specific to the vegetable and herb gardens that we might be starting in our yard. So the very first thing that I want to mention is um, the importance of that ecosystem as Jessica was talking about and all the benefits of the native plants. We need to keep in mind though, we tend to plan our vegetable gardens as something separate, like it has to be by itself and it's completely separate from our native plants. And so one thing to keep in mind as we start to plan our vegetable and herb gardens is that they are still part of the ecosystem. So a lot of the foods that we eat or grow in our gardens are not native to here, but we, you know, even though they're introduced, they are now part of the ecosystem, whether that's on a balcony or in your, your front yard or backyard, our vegetable plants are part of the ecosystem. So we just need to keep that in mind when we're planning um, where we want to put our garden and how we're going to nurture these plants and take care of them. We want to do this in a way, we still want to grow our food in a way that is friendly to the environment. We wanna work with nature, not against it. And um, it really helps when we observe nature and we try to mimic the way things happen in nature. It helps us to keep the system in balance and it actually reduces the amount of work that we need to do in the garden. For example, if we're attracting certain insects, they can help control other insects. Or if we watch the way leaves fall and decompose and the forest floor becomes this big spongy, you know, beautiful soil that we walk on and it just feels like you're walking on a pillow, um, we can kind of recreate that through our composting. So there are different methods that we can use in our garden that um, really help save us work and create a healthier garden just by trying to mimic what happens in nature and mimic those natural processes. So let's just keep in mind that our vegetables and herbs don't have to be separate and um, they're all part of the whole system. So the first thing we need to think about is starting our plants. So do we want to start from seed or do we want to start um, by purchasing plants? Either is fine. Um, we have maybe some more options if you're starting from seed, but, um, and Kyle is going to talk a little bit about that also when we talk about sourcing our plants and our seeds. But one thing to keep in mind when we're planning our garden in terms of seeds or plants is timing. So there are certain things like pepper plants, if you want to grow peppers, those, if you wanna start those from seeds, they really need to be started a bit earlier, like February or March. If we were to start those later, once it's warm enough outside, like late May, um, they're really not going to have very much time to grow and mature and give us a lot of peppers before the season is over and it gets cold again. So if we're at this point in April and getting into May and we haven't started seeds, then we may want to consider plants instead. So that's just something to think about there in terms of whether we grow from seed or plants. Um, a lot of it is about timing. And if we've missed that window to start the seeds, then we can get plants. And then there are other things that we can put in the garden like bean plants, like in this picture, you can start those you know, even in late May and they grow very quickly and you'll still get beans and that's fantastic. So you can do plants or seeds. It's all about timing. So that's one thing to consider when we're starting to plan our gardens. Now here, the next thing we need to decide is what seeds or what plants do we want to begin with? What exactly is it that we want to grow? So um, some of the things to consider here, first of all, I've got, I've got kind of three rules here for what you should grow in the garden. The first thing I always say, just grow what you want to eat. You know, if you absolutely can't stand a certain vegetable, <laughs> then, you know, maybe don't take up a lot of space in your garden with that vegetable. But, you know, if it's something you're really trying to incorporate into your diet and it's beneficial and you feel like if you grow it, maybe you're more likely to eat, to eat it, then fantastic. But generally speaking, grow what you want to eat and what you will use. And then secondly, we want to grow what wants to grow, kind of like Jessica was talking about. Do you have a wet area or a dry area? Do you have sun or shade? Again, it reduces the amount of work that we have to do and extra support that we need to give these plants when we give them the conditions that they naturally thrive in. So if you have kind of more moist soil, you can maybe try cucumbers, but something like carrots might not be the best choice for that area because they might get root rot in that really soggy soil. If you have heavy clay, which is very common in this area. We often have just, you know, even a couple inches of topsoil and then we hit clay 
not everything is going to want to grow in that in those conditions. You can spend time and add compost and amend the soil over time, but that might take a while. So if you're growing right now, then we might want to consider maybe a raised bed or choosing crops that can handle a bit of that clay. So that would be things like cabbage and greens, um, lettuce, Swiss chard, and even squash can handle some clay and a little bit of um, wet soil that often comes with clay. Again, maybe not carrots because they're going to hit that hard clay and really have a hard time getting that root down nice and deep to give us a good sized carrot. So if we have a little bit of shade where we would like to have our garden, lettuce will do just fine. If you're growing something that produces a fruit like a tomato or a pepper or a root like a carrot or beets, they do need more sun to develop that. But a lot of our leafy greens will do just fine with a little bit of light shade. So maybe choose to grow greens there instead of tomatoes. And then if we have maybe poor soil, and again, we want to amend that and improve that soil over time. But one of the things we might be able to grow that can handle some of that poor soil or low nutrient soil, and at the same time, be able to um, actually add nitrogen to the soil and help us improve that soil could be something like beans. So we have some choices there. And then the other thing too is um, my, my third, my number three, so grow what you wanna eat, grow what wants to grow in the space we have. And then third, grow something fun every year. So maybe something new or different, try something new, just, just keep it fun and keep it interesting. And then when we're citing our space, we want to consider a lot of the same things as well. How much space do we have available to us? How much space do we need? Like how many plants do we actually need to grow? And um, you know, sometimes you can grow one carrot as just one carrot, but one zucchini plant can feed a whole neighborhood for the summer. So you know, how many plants do we need, especially of each variety of things we want to grow? And then how much space does each plant need? We want to make sure we're not crowding our plants so that they're competing for resources and too close can cause you know, pest and disease issues. But if we leave them spread too far apart, we're leaving open space where weeds can pop up. So spacing is a, is a, a consideration. And then again, do we have sun or shade? Do we have wet or dry areas? And then the area that we might have in mind to put our garden, is it close by? Because we need easy access to it. We're going to water and pull a weed here and there and harvest our, our food. And if we place the garden in a place that's way far out and maybe out of sight and something we're not actively walking past or an area we're walking through often, it tends to get neglected. It's just easier when it's close by and you're, you're seeing it and you're, um, it just makes maintenance much easier and harvesting and enjoyment when we can see it and it's close by. And then we also need water source, like what, you know, do we have a place for access for a hose or things like that? And if we put it way far out, that might make that a little more difficult as well. And then our soil, do we have good soil? Um, should I be growing directly in the ground or do I need raised beds? And this is a really common question. And typically, unless you have an issue with soil contaminants or really poor soil, then Absolutely, you can grow in the ground. That's where plants started growing. You know, people didn't always go and build raised beds for them and baby them like we do. So um, we can, as long as we have decent soil to grow in, then we certainly can do that. Obviously not if we're concerned about the potential for soil contaminants. And that depends a lot on where we grow and each individual site, you know, has its own, um, has its own story and different needs. So, um, if we, if we can have the benefit though of having those microorganisms in the soil to really benefit our plants and have our plants have contact with that native soil, that's fantastic. Um, otherwise, if you have a small space, containers are great and um, raised beds are wonderful. And that can also be a benefit for different accessibility issues for trying to actually tend the garden and all kinds of other things. So it really just, it depends on each person, but raised beds have become so popular that a lot of times people think they have to use a raised bed. You don't necessarily have to, but it is, it is one option. So those are some things to think about. And then if we're growing in a container or a raised bed, if we're growing things with shallow roots, you're okay with a more shallow bed. But if we're growing something with a big root system, maybe some big tomato plants, we wanna make sure that those raised beds or containers are deep enough to accommodate the root systems of larger plants. 
And then every year we need to replenish our soil. If we've been growing in a space and our plants have used up some of those nutrients in that space, then we want to make sure that we um, replenish what's been used. We want to add compost and we really want to nurture healthy soil because healthy soil makes healthy plants. And um, we can add just sometimes even with common plants that are growing in the area or even our weeds, we can use those as natural fertilizers. I just wanna throw that out there as we're talking about replenishing nutrients, but I'm happy to answer questions about that at the end too, if we have time. Um, some of these weeds are really full of nutrients and we can soak them in a bucket of water and kind of make a tea and pull some of those nutrients out and use that to water the garden and add those nutrients back even as we're pulling the weeds out. And then my final consideration here is um, choosing the varieties to grow. There are different sizes. Some vegetables and herbs are compact or grow in a bush form and some are a vine and um, tomatoes, determinate ones stay to a certain size. Indeterminate will grow, you know, usually very large and might need more support and trellising. What is the purpose? Are we growing something to make sauce or um, slices, you know, of tomatoes for a sandwich? That can determine what variety we want. Um, things like peppers, do we want spicy or sweet or, you know, all of these different things. Um, and then the growing, the days to maturity, if something is going to be ready in 30 days, we can harvest it and then plant something else after it. If it's going to take a long time, then we need to know that it's going to take up that much space in the garden until it's ready. So those are all considerations when we are trying to um, choose what to grow and our varieties. And then the very next thing, and I'm going to stop sharing here because the very next thing that I always consider when planning the garden is our layout and our design. And so I like to put all of these things together, my vegetables and herbs and flowers and my native plants, everything all together. And so Kyla is going to talk to us about that today, like how that's helpful and um, ways that we can do that. Thank you, Connie. All right, let me just I uh, get my slides going here. Um, I'm Kyla Muhammad, the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Conservation Foundation. And I am going to talk a little bit more about native plants and your veggie gardens and how really when you're planting um, those together, they form a synergetic system. Some of those key benefits of in, uh, incorporating native plants and organic vegetable garden plants together is that, first of all, it really can increase your pollination. And that increased pollination means more abundant harvests of your veggie crops. Another key benefit that I'll talk a bit more about is um, you will get a lot more natural pest control for some of those different garden pests um, that might be irritating or destroying your um, veggie plants. As Connie mentioned as, as well, um, you know, integrating the two of them really does help support healthy soils. Um, Jessica talked about the root systems of the native plants and how they can penetrate really deep in the soil and bring up nutrients. This can also really help benefit your vegetable plants as well and making them healthier. And that results in having healthier food. Um, pulling that all together, when um, you look in, you're looking at the plants, um, the more um, insects as well as wildlife, the microbes that can start to thrive in the soil, it's all creating this healthier gardening ecosystem, um, which ultimately does lead to more biodiversity as well. So rewinding a little bit here about why organic, um, that is because organic gardening, um, it doesn't just, when, when you're using pesticides, it doesn't just affect the garden pests. Um, it can affect us as people, as well as those pollinators and those beneficial insects. So, you know, pollinators can help increase our crop yields. Um, but if we're using pesticides and things like that, that will harm the pollinators, um, then, then that's an issue. Those beneficial insects that we could be attracting through the use of native plants also can be impacted by the pesticides. Since the pesticides are just broad and they can't discriminate between um, the insects that we want and the ones that we don't. In terms of potential um, impacts on us, a lot of the common um, pesticides um, may be carcinogenic, 
and have been linked to cancer, among other health concerns relating to your, our nervous system, hormones, um, and endocrine system as well. So drilling a little bit more into the importance of pollinators, um, you know, and, and why should we support pollinators in our vegetable gardens? It's really because um, native pollinators, especially bees, are the backbone of our food supply. Um, and pollination is super important for our vegetables. The National, uh, uh, the National, I'm sorry, Natural Resources Conservation Service says that Animals pollinate approximately 75% of the crops grown worldwide for food, fiber, beverages, condiments, spices, medicines. Um, so think about that. Three out of four of the crops that we're growing for all these different reasons um, rely on pollination. They also say that one out of every three to four mouthfuls of food that we eat and the beverages that we drink are delivered to us by pollinators. Um, taking that even a step further, our native bees, I feel like, are the our um, our unsung heroes. So um, we know a lot about honeybees um, for a number of reasons. One of which is that they provide us with that delicious honey um, that many of us love. They tend to um, kind of move in swarms, where a lot of our native bees are smaller. Um, they're solitary bees. They're kind of um, harder to spot. But um, in almost all crops, native bees are the pr uh, primary pollinator or they significantly supplement the activity of honeybees. So really both the honeybees and our native bees um, really are contributing to um, our food system. Another interesting thing about native bees are that a number of them are pollen specialists uh, where they rely on the pollen from specific plants. And um, some of those plants that they rely on are actually some of our food crops. So some of those native bees are critical pollinators to things like squashes, pumpkins, gourds, as well as our annual sunflower. And to just further drive home that point, uh, I wanted you just to take a look at this chart here. Um, I don't expect you to read all of it, but um, it's illustrating the crops that are dependent upon pollination. So as you can see, there's just a ton of different things um, that we use and eat that we need our pollinators for. So um, talking a little bit more about those beneficial insects, one might ask, well, okay, I get pollinators, but why do I want some of those other insects in my vegetable garden? And the reason for that is that beneficial insects will kill and eat a lot of those different garden pests so they can really help your vegetable garden thrive um, and, and not necessarily be as susceptible to those diseases that some of, some of the garden pests carry or uh, defoliating your leaves or, or things like that. So um, in terms of incorporating those native plants, um, they can attract more of what we call our garden friends, uh, insects like ladybugs, ground beetles, uh, minute pirate bugs, green lacewings, aphid midges, damsel bugs, spiders, and brach brachinid wasps. And a lot of those beneficial insects um, will target you know, some of our garden enemies like aphids, certain caterpillars, thrips, slugs, white flies, mites, as well as some of those specialist beetles that really target our vegetable crops. What co first comes to mind for those beetles are things like um, the ones that target our squash and our cucumbers and our potatoes. In addition to those native plants attracting those beneficial insects, they also um, attract a lot of beneficial wildlife into our yards and gardens. Um, and that wildlife can also help with some of these other garden pests like fro frogs and toads will eat some of those slugs. Bluebirds and wrens really have a lot of insects as part of their diet, so they can help with those insect pests. And then things like snakes, owls, hawks can also um, reduce that rodent pressure. And when you look at all of that together in its entirety with the, the native plants, as well as um, the wildlife and these beneficial insects supporting the soil, um, that's all the more biodiversity. And that means the more resilience um, in your yard and ecosystem and um, your overall garden landscape. 
So in terms of incorporating those natives into your vegetable garden, I think there's two easy approaches to this, depending on the design that you kind of like. So this ties back into what Jessica was saying with the nice but neat um, versus some of the more um, wild and free. So if you like more of a structured vegetable garden, it's um, easiest to probably plant some of those natives in pocket gardens or along the perimeter. Um, since you are, um, a lot of those vegetables are probably your annuals, the native plants can kind of surround it. So that's re really what the picture on the left is showing here. There's um, a native rain garden behind um, those raised beds for the, for the vegetable gardens, as well as native plants kind of going all around the perimeter. There's also um, another native pollinator garden off to the side of those, those um, raised vegetable beds as well. So it's still getting pulled in and being attracted to, um, to the landscape. If you like more of a wilder vegetable garden kind of demonstrated here on the right, then really using companion planting can be great. Companion planting is just using different types of plants together that will benefit each other in some, some way. So um, in terms of that, you know, there's natural pest repellents uh, where you can use some of those native plants that have these strong aromatic oils like your wild onions and wild garlic or mountain mint are some of those natives you can plant nearby and it can cause some pest confusion um, in being able to identify those plants that they really like to eat and munch on. I'm going to say more broadly for our native plants, a lot of those are attractants for those beneficial insects I was talking about. So having those peppered um, throughout your gardening space to attract those beneficials is great. Um, and some of those are like yarrow and coreopsis as well as goldenrod. Some other um, favorite pollinator plants, and I have these kind of laid out um, going through the seasons, is Jessica was talking about for bloom time. This is something to think about for your vegetable garden as well, because if you, particularly when you're also talking about that companion planting, if you put those native plants that are going to be blooming around the same time as when those veggie plants are going to be blooming, that can definitely increase that um, pollination even more. So, you know, in the springtime, you've got things like your golden Alexander, as well as um, like your common blue violets. Um, in that late spring, common yarrow starts to come into bloom, and is, that's another pollinator magnet. From the early summer all the way to late summer, you've got a bunch of great long blooming plants in there, um, including your blazing stars, your purple cone flowers, um, your milkweeds like butterfly milkweed, uh, mountain mint and wild bergamot, which is another um, pollinator magnet and your black eyed Susans. And then particularly too, if you're gonna be doing a fall crop for your vegetable gardens, then even more so it's important to have some of those um, natives that are gonna be blooming to support those pollinators towards the end of the season. So that's where your golden rods and asters can, can, um, can serve that function as well. So if we transition to talking about sourcing your seeds um, as well as sourcing your plants, when you're sourcing your seeds, you know, it's really more about investing that time. Um, obviously sourcing seeds, it's cheaper than buying those starter plants. You can source them from friends, family, local seed libraries or seed exchanges, as well as um, seed retailers. Um, Connie mentioned about how you have to be careful about when you start them. There might also be special germination requirements um, as well for that particular plant. Native plants can be um, much trickier to get to germinate, as well as they can um, take a lot longer to germinate and really establish. So I would strongly recommend um, for those native plants starting with um, the seedlings of those transplants versus from seed, unless you have a lot of time and patience. And another thing just to remember with seeds is that the fresher the seed, the better the germination rate. So if you have some old seed laying around, you might want to use um, a bit more of it, understanding that your germination rate is probably not going to be as high as fresh seed. In terms of sourcing your plants, um, this is more of the investing the money route. 
Um, they're more expensive than starting with the seeds, but you get much faster establishment. It also allows you, if you're going to be starting your garden a little bit later than you expected, um, to, to still be able to get it going that season. You can source from um, friends, family, local plant swaps. When you're talking about specifically for your native plants, um, native plant sales or um, native plant retailers are great sources. A lot of the best quality as well as prices are gonna be found at some of your local native plant sales that are usually conducted in um, either late April or early May. You do wanna avoid purchasing native plants from those big box retailers because a lot of them do still treat their native plants with insecticides that are gonna harm those pollinators and beneficial insects that we're trying to attract. In terms of your veggie plants, you can buy organic vegetable plants that are either labeled as organic or you can get them from a source um, where you know that the plants weren't treated with chemicals. So essentially they were organically grown. Um, and as Connie mentioned, um, usually you can, you can get away with um, planting those in um, springtime, but some of those can also be planted in the fall. So that's a thing to check as well. And another great place um, where you can source some of those seeds as well as plants um, is our annual plant sale that Connie mentioned that is coming up here on um, May 12th and May 13th um, at McDonald Farm in Naperville. And uh, there's also a link in the chat for that. So with that, um, I think we can, we will move into the Q and A portion. Yes, thank you so much, Kyla. Thank you, Jessica, also. So we have been, Kyla and Jessica have been fantastic about staying on top of questions that have popped up in the Q&A uh, box on our screen. So we've been answering those through chat while we've been presenting. Um, if there are other additional questions, we can go ahead and um, take some questions now. We have a few minutes left and we can answer some questions live, or we can also review some of the questions that came up in the Q&A uh, box there because we had some good questions there too. So maybe not everyone has seen those yet. So we can touch on a couple of those as well. I'm gonna actually take a look and pull those up now. Okay, so um, we've got a question here. Let's see, how close do the native plants need to be to the vegetable garden in order to be beneficial. So keeping with the nice and neat style. I love this question. I love this question. Kyla, since you were just talking about that, I'm gonna let you touch on that one. Um, but that's, yeah, that's a fantastic question. And then I see right after that, we'll do the next one, which was about mountain mint. I think Jessica was typing an answer, but we can answer that one out loud too. Kyla, do you wanna start with how close the native plants should be to the vegetable garden? Yeah, I would say, you know, ideally um, within like a few feet, um, you know, typically like it kind of depends on you, the, the beneficial insects, like the specific beneficial insects, some of them kind of um, travel further than some other ones. But I think a good rule of thumb is um, within a few feet would be ideal. Yeah, and I, I think I would... I totally agree with that. Having them, you know, as close in proximity as we can, it just, it's increasing that biodiversity and having the mixed system. So the closer, the better, but at the same time, one thing that can be a bit tricky when you're planning out your spacing is that a lot of our native plants that we're talking about are perennials and a lot of our vegetables and herbs, you know, some are perennials as well, but a lot of those are annuals. And so it can sometimes be a little bit tricky to incorporate those annuals in and around your natives without digging and disturbing the roots of the native plants that are perennials that are staying there, or even things like oregano, you know, things that are um, not necessarily a native plant, but a perennial herb. So sometimes it doesn't, it's not always easy to put them right in, right together next to each other, but, you know, as close as we can is fantastic, just so that we get the benefits of having that mix. I was also just going to add really quickly yeah. to that. Um, the other thing too is, you know, there are some of those perennial vegetables like, you know, your asparagus, your rhubarb, um, like Connie said, some herbs and things like that. So um, it's great if you're growing perennial veggies or herbs, it's a lot easier to have those um, other native perennial plants closer. Absolutely. And then you can even use going beyond the 
the vegetables and herbs, but start to get in some fruits, maybe do, you know, strawberries as your ground cover because they'll spread and those things all incorporate beautifully together. It's another perennial edible that, you know, will complement your asparagus. You get this beautiful, delicious spring fruit and it, it'll tie right in with your perennial native plants as well. Yeah, I love that. Jessica, can you tell us about mountain mint, please? Speaking of also edibles, so mountain mint is a native plant that can be used to make tea. It's got this wonderful mint, but it doesn't spread like crazy in the garden. So this is a great question about how does mountain mint spread? What is its growth habit like? Yes, great question, Connie. And you kind of set it up right there. Um, so mountain mint can spread less than other mint species, but mint species do have a tendency to spread rhizominously, if I can say that right now, Connie, <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, but um, through little roots underground, right, and they, they see prolifically as well, so some mint species can spread and fill out a lot more than other native plant species, so that is definitely something to consider, um, because like you're saying, we love it, we're like, this is a plant that we can make into tea. We can do a lot of different things with it and has great pollinator benefits. But one of those things you want to weigh, how much space do I have? Um, can it fill out this space? Um, because most mint species will do that. Uh, but mountain mint can be a little bit uh, easier of a, of a species to fit into a space. Yeah, absolutely. It's a fantastic plant. They're so pretty. I like mountain mm -hmm. mint a lot. Mm -hmm. We have another question about uh, if we're starting a raised bed on concrete, which is a, a hugely popular way to create a garden when you don't necessarily have the land to grow in. We can do rooftop gardens and start a whole you know, urban farm in the middle of a parking lot. So we can do this. You can grow, you can have a garden on concrete. Raised beds are a good way to do that. So the question is how, what do we put on the bottom so that you can still have drainage without losing your soil and having that wash away? So I would say, I, I personally tend to try to avoid plastics, but you can use like a landscape fabric as a liner um, and kind of have it go up the insides before you fill the bed. And it'll help keep that soil in if you have an you know, open bottom. Um, sometimes depending on the size of the bed, people will even do like strips of wood and then do a liner. There, there are different things that you can do, but you're right, it is a good idea to have some kind of a liner. I just personally prefer to, try not to use plastic, but that is another option if you're using something that, um, you know, can have holes or can be porous enough for drainage, but hold the soil in. If it's something that um, we, it has to be food safe if you're growing food crops. And, um, you know, so those are some considerations there. I don't know if you guys want to add to that at all. Okay. I think the next one also is a great question. We've got, um, do you recommend any of the wild plants for large outdoor flower pots? So we've got some really deep roots like Jessica was talking about on those native plants. So what do you guys say about that? Really interesting question. Um, and one of our colleagues, Jennifer Hammer, actually used to grow um, native plants in large flower pots really often um, and had kind of like a um, prairie in a pot style, right? Because there are a lot of situations where we'd like some of these pots or have some of these pollinator benefits in areas where we can only have pots, I'm sorry, um, or you have a porch or something. Um, you just have, you know, a balcony that you want to get some uh, native plants in um, out there. So um, pots can be an option. Um, the, the big asterisk for this is just to make sure they're big enough. So they do require a little bit of a bigger pot. Um, not just for how big the root systems are, but so that way they have some soil uh, insulating them in those winter months. But you can also sometimes wrap the pot with something to try to keep it a little warmer, like you might protect some sort of, you know, a tree or um, more ornamental plant that can't handle as harsh a winter. You might be able to wrap it in something to give it a little bit of insulation. Um, but in those pots, I, I similar to what I was kind of saying in the presentation, I still kind of recommend starting with something like one little blue stem plant or one um, side oats grama is another nice grass, like at least one grass in there to give the pot some structure. Um, but then within that, you can work in some of the other native prairie plants that might only be a couple feet tall, right? Um, like you could try butterfly milkweed. I have not tried that in a pot specifically myself, but coneflower is very adaptable and hardy. Um, Connie, Kyla, do you have any other suggestions on some some I specific think, plants? I think also um, there's several varieties of, of blazing star, but I would say um, probably um, like the dwarf blazing star. There's 
I, I would I would check out that family because there's some of them that I, I think would do well also um, in a pot. And even um, going back to like the black eyed Susans, like they're very, very resilient. <laughs> so, you know, your cone flower, your black eyed Susans, um, like I said, your blazing star, like you said, adding in sort of that that grass to kind of fill it out. Like that's already a very pretty and um, ecologically functional grouping. <laughs> I agree. And I actually was going to say Black Eyed Susan, especially when we, we've got some biennials that, you know, um, are shorter lived, they reseed and they might not necessarily, um, because they're not coming back year after year after year after year, they have a slightly shorter lifespan. And they, um, even though they do have deep roots, they can handle, they're in that growth stage a little bit still, and they can handle a large pot um, so that that was going to be my my suggestion as well. Oh. We are a couple minutes over, so I, I want to touch on just a couple last quick questions. If you guys are okay, I know if people need to log off, this will be recorded and you can catch up on it later. And we will be doing the Facebook Live session to answer more of these questions. Um, but if if Kyla and Jessica are okay with answering one or two more quick ones, and then we'll we'll log off in just a minute. Um, that's up to you guys. We'll, we'll, do we see if we have a quick minute? <laughs> okay, we'll try to do one or two just really quick, um, quick ones again, and then um, and then we'll we'll sign off for the day. But please do join us on that Facebook Live, and we can answer more questions then on May first from one to two p.m. So the the next question we have was um, keeping plants away from each other that are not companions. How far apart should they be when we're working in a smaller space? So I, I, you guys might want to add to this, but my first thought is it depends on the, the size of the plants and their, the reach of their roots. Um, it's really sometimes when plants don't get along with others, it's because they are allelopathic, which means they actually produce their own kind of like their own natural herbicide that prevents other plants from growing. So we just need to give them enough space so that you know, the soil around the roots is clear and free and there's no intermingling there. Um, so they don't always need to be completely separate, but there are sometimes when it, you know, kind of has a farther reach and, and we would want more space, but generally a few feet should be okay, but it depends on the roots. So I, I would say, I don't know, do you guys want to add to that answer? I, I think, I mean, you, I think you pretty much nailed my thoughts on it. A lot of it, I think, has to do with kind of the, the root system spread of those two plants. Okay. All right. And then um, the next question, I'm going to throw this one at you, Kyla, because no. <laughs> is it possible to successfully grow veggies in containers? So Kyla and I have been doing all kinds of vegetable container gardening workshops. So the short answer is yes. But I'm going <laughs> to let Kyla elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, um, so absolutely. Um, there's all sort of sorts of different things you can grow. Um, I think the biggest thing is kind of even going back to that root system is really one of the biggest factors. You know, if it's got, um, if, if you have a shallower pot, you know, things like your, think about like a lot of your like leafy stuff. So like, um, you know, your lettuces, um, even like doing um, like your kales and things like that. Like a lot of your leafy stuff you can kind of do um, in a not as deep of a, or as big of a pot as you would need for um, like tomatoes. So like tomatoes, you probably would want to pick a determinant variety, um, use it like probably like a 10 gallon pot size. Um, that that should give it plenty, plenty of room. Peppers are another one that people grow a lot um, that are usually pretty, pretty easy to grow in pots. Um, but there's, you could do sweet potatoes, you could do, um, I don't know, all sorts of things. <laughs> kind of help, help me out, add some other stuff in here. <laughs> you, you can really do anything and depending yeah. on the size of the container. If you have a yeah. smaller container, you can grow some lettuce. If you've got a big container, grow some tomatoes. You know, it's so depends on the, the size of the containers, but most, most of our vegetable and herb plants can do wonderfully in a container. We just need to give them enough space for the roots. And actually on that note, we have a, a suggestion on here too, um, where uh, Denise, thank you so much for this. Uh, she said a, a tall garbage can works great for planting native plants and you can paint the outside any color. You've got room for deep, you know, some of those deeper roots. So that was, that was a really cool suggestion too. Um, and unfortunately there are a few other questions. We won't be able to get to all of them now. We do need to sign off. Uh, I do wanna thank everyone for joining us today and um, feel free, our contact information is in our um, 
It's on the website and it was in the presentation. So if you need to refer back to it, the recording will be posted on YouTube and you can also just email our general um, information email at the Conservation Foundation and um, we'll get the questions to the right people and can answer those for you and join us on the Facebook Live. We'll answer more questions and hopefully we'll see you at our upcoming events, our Earth Day benefit and the plant sale and all kinds of other fun things that we've got going on, uh, not only on the farm, but around in the community. So we, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Kyla and Jessica. Thank you. Thank you.